All right, good. Yes, sorry. Get our own water, Oscar's pretty nice. John over here. Hey. hey what's up, man? What's up? Uh, first of all, congratulations on uh, re-signing. Uh, so uh, I feel like that kind of maybe caught people off guard, like they didn't know that you had to resign or maybe your contract was up. So when that was that a breath of relief, a sigh of like, how relieved were you to get past that? Oh, it's always a relief, you know, and hopefully, you know, for the UFC, it's a relief as well. And they want me along for the ride. You know, I'm 11 years in, you know, just signed a new four year deal, which in theory would take me uh, through 15 years to be about 48 years old. But anytime you're in a negotiation, you know, there are things that happen that, you know, give you pause, right? And that can just mean that there's some idling and communication for times and you're sitting there with your wife thinking, man, do they, do they want me? I just don't know. So I had to navigate that as I've had to do throughout my broadcasting career. But these are the producers and bosses that I want to work for. You know, I've had experiences in television with other producers. These are the guys that I want to go to battle with. You know, this is the job I want. My employer knows this is my dream job. And um, thankfully, I'll get the chance to you know, hold it down for another four years or so. So as someone who's covered sports, called sports, obviously been a fan of sports, you obviously hear about free agents and this and that, like test the water and everything. But when you're on the other side of it and now you're the one, you're the commodity, is it a weird feeling? Like you've watched this through the television, but now you're part of it. It is, you know, and I didn't necessarily look at this as being my broadcasting free agency. And certainly you can argue it could hurt me from a leveraging standpoint if I profess to the masses I have my dream job and I'm looking to keep it, you know. Um, but, you know... UFC President Dana White is the type of leader that you want to break down a wall for, right? I mean, the global pandemic obviously laid the foundation for that and all that we can do when we put our minds to something as a staff, you know? Um, but he's also a demanding boss, right? And obviously there have been times, right? I'm on the air 25 nights a year for eight hours. There are certainly times where there's an utterance that Dana or Zach Candido or Craig Borsari doesn't like, and I'm going to hear it, you know? Um, but I accept that challenge of working for these guys. And, um, you know, when I left ESPN in 2011, there were a lot of people that were like, dude, you spent a big chunk of your career trying to get to Bristol, Connecticut. Now you've been there for a cup of coffee and you're leaving. Um, I kind of felt like I knew what I was doing humbly when I hitched myself to this wagon and um, just thankful to be 11 years in. And, and I'm hoping it's the last job I ever have. Looking at your week this week, how different is it preparing for a big pay-per-view in New York City, Madison Square Garden, as opposed to anywhere else, like the Fight Islands, the, Gar the Vegas, the TD Gardens? I used to talk about the Conor McGregor effect, the Ronda Rousey effect, and just how everything is heightened in terms of the media obligations and everything else. And I think New York City has an effect that is similar. Now, for a Boston guy, this is like a whole lot of fucking New York stuff for me, if I'm being honest, right? Madison Square Garden, the Mecca, world's most famous arena. Little much for a Boston guy in enemy territory. But yes, it is ratcheted up, right? Everything is bigger in New York City. And, um, you know, sometimes I tend to lean into the promotional hyperbole a little bit in terms of promoting these pay-per-views. But I think most of us as media members, commentators, as a fan base can look at this fight card at UFC 281 and acknowledge we can't do much better in terms of putting a pay-per-view fight card together. So thankfully, it seems like New York gets this annual showcase every November and uh, blowing it out here Saturday night, Jose. Are there any fights that you have circled that maybe you don't think fans and media are talking about enough besides the top three or four? Well, certainly Dominic Reyes has a lot of eyeballs on him, right, given what his last few fights have held, the strength of schedule, obviously how close his fight was with John Jones. But this is a real crossroads fight for him and for Ryan Spann. You know, Ryan Spann is 6'6". Six, six. He's a monster plus athlete in every sense, finishing instincts in every realm of the game. But only one of those guys leaves Madison Square Garden, a bona fide light heavyweight contender. So that's a big fight that jumps off the page for me. And um, obviously, you know, I try to lean into all 28 athletes and um, I can make a case for the first prelim, right? Nikolai Negumedianu shouldn't be the first fight on any fight car, right? That dude's a beast. So we're excited, man. Just sprint to the finish. Then finally, I've been asking everyone this at both media days. Uh, this is going to be Frankie's last fight. You kind of touched upon it a bit at the press conference, but you kind of want to give the athletes the shine. So uh, what are some of the memories you've had of covering Frankie's over the years or just in and out of the octagon? Well, you know, when he beat BJ Penn in 2010, I was not on staff, but I remember exactly where I was in Bristol, Connecticut, just watching it transpire and thinking, oh, my God, Frankie's going to do it. He's a bantamweight fighting up two weight classes. And, of course, he finally made his way back down to 135 pounds. But he's just done everything the right way every step of the way. 
yesterday. And uh, certainly here in the U.S., where MMA hasn't been as big at times as it's been in Australia and Brazil and other places, Frankie's as beloved as anyone. And I think it's a byproduct of his style as sort of the little engine that could. You know, I posted something on Instagram, a picture of my son being super small, and immediately Frankie chimes in like, small guys are just fine, bro. You know, don't height discriminate. So I'm excited to see what Frankie can do with the showcase. I feel like it's a, a winnable fight for him. And, um, you know, his daughter Valentina is going to be in the building for the first time. So um, we'll see if daddy can produce. Last question. Do you think Chris at Media Day, he's like, I'm going to send him off with no remorse, like he's had his time. Do you think that's the right approach for a young athlete just not kind of looking into fighting a hero, but I'm going to send this guy off on a, you know, like on a stretcher? It seems as though there was an interaction with Chris Gutierrez and Frankie Edgar nine years ago at a regional event, and Chris seemingly took exception, exception to something Frankie said. Frankie doesn't remember this interaction. So all of a sudden there is kind of this... I don't know, bad blood underlying this matchup now. So I don't think Gutierrez is the type of fighter that is emotional. You know, he's one of the best in the world. He really is. I mean, he's the best non-ranked bantamweight right now, deserves this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, Pereira has provided a whole lot of ammunition for Israel Adesanya. I mean, he has leaned heavily into all of that stuff. And I don't think it's going to play a factor on fight night. And I don't think for Gutierrez it will either. Just curious, going off Adesanya, you know, you get to see these guys, we all see them walking around the hotel, we kind of get a, a sense of their vibe on fight week. Do you feel the same as me, that Israel seems a little bit more stoic and a little bit less fun this week? He seems to be here to, have, to get to business as well. Absolutely, you got the right read, and part of that is calculated to be sure. I mean, he wanted to be reactive this week and not really leading the dance, and even I thought his approach at the press conference you know, wasn't necessarily an approach he had taken prior. He was very subdued, and I think perhaps that has something to do with the matchup, but also Valentina Shevchenko will be the first to tell you, you got to manage your energy with the media all week. I mean, some of these fighters come into this setting with you guys, and granted, you sit down with them a little bit earlier than we do, but we'll sit down with them on Thursday. They're about to go into their weight cut, and they're giving us all of this great energy, and sometimes I can't help but think, even though we're extracting good things from them, that, man, might want to save a little bit of that energy. So I think part of it is just saving his energy and, and not wanting to get overly emotional. Um, but yeah, I definitely am sensing a different vibe from Izzy uh, this week than prior pay-per-views. And similar to that, so then you have Dustin yesterday who's very subdued here at the media day, but then you've got Michael Chandler who'll give you a monologue on any question you ask him. It's curious to see the difference in those two energies, but yet they still produce the same sort of output in the cage. I'm curious what's your take on that fight. Yeah, no, I, oh, I cannot wait for that fight. And I will also say, you know, when Daniel Cormier and I were at the Residence Inn in Las Vegas with Dustin Poirier before that second fight with Conor McGregor and we were all going to go to Fight Island, we sort of sensed some tension from Dustin Poirier, right? And I think DC was sort of like, huh, this is sort of a weird vibe I'm getting from Dustin. And then what does he do? Goes to Fight Island and knocks out Conor McGregor. You know, so sometimes I think we can lean in a little bit too much to that stuff. You know, Dustin just doesn't really care about feelings. He cares about fighting. And I know that's sort of a simplistic way to put it, but I just don't think, you know, even if you saw these two guys in their interview with DC and DC said, you know, doesn't he, Chandler, like, have the right to be a little bit upset? And Dustin's like, dude, I don't give a fuck, you know? So I just think they're absolute warriors, you know? I am a bit surprised at the betting line, if I'm being honest. Michael Chandler was plus 150. He's swelled to, like, plus 190. Um, so I didn't expect the fight to be that wide. Um, but what an opportunity for Poirier to prove that his UFC experience means a whole lot. You know, if there was any genesis for the bad blood, it was that Poirier seemingly felt like Chandler got a little bit fast-tracked when he came to the UFC, and um, I guess he's earned the fight now. Last one for me. You talked about managing your energy if you're a fighter for fight week. When you have a fight like that on the card with Dustin and Michael, do you kind of have to think, like, okay, so we're starting the pay-per-view, but in two fights' time, I know I'm going to be screaming and shouting for three rounds. Do you kind of have to look at that as you're going up the fight cards? Well, when I first got hired, we were doing 10 or 11 fights a night and not 15. I know, <laughs> the glory days, Oscar. But I was even told, I remember by Craig Borsari before my first show, like you need to save room in your register because the fights get bigger as the night goes along. But the one thing that I can control is my energy. And a lot of it is just in the lead up all week. I'm not going to dinner Friday night. I'm not really drinking during fight week because I need to have energy for my broadcast partners. And if they ebb and flow during the night, that's the one thing that I can really control. I might not be as articulate on one night. I might be flubbing all the time, but the energy is always the thing that I can control. And, uh, you know, adrenaline's a powerful thing. I mean, to me, this is the craziest live sporting event setting in the world. And 
that I feed off of that adrenaline. I feed off my broadcast partners and, um, you know, haven't really gassed out yet. I mean, I get to the hotel room, I'm toast, but I don't know that I've gassed out on the air yet. Congrats on the new deal, then. My man, thank you. John over here. Uh, besides being, you know, the voice of the octagon, you, obviously you can tell how much of a fan you are and you're an ambassador of the sport and, and of the UFC. Saturday is going to be the 29th year anniversary from the very first UFC. Obviously, from that day in Colorado to now, we've gone huge. I mean, look at it. We're at Madison Square Garden. That said, we still want to grow. We want it to be the biggest sport, bigger than football and, and soccer. What's, what, what's a change we can make or maybe a step that could go forward that, in your opinion, will take us to that level? It's a good question, but I really feel like we're getting there and we are on the cusp. You know, the Fox deal laid a great foundation for us domestically and now the ESPN deal has helped us in theory take it to the next level. But I'm telling you guys, like, and the Australians and the Kiwis know this, like, when you go to an airport in Australia the day after a UFC pay-per-view, most of those people have not only watched the fight card, they've watched the damn post-fight press conference as well. The UFC is the NFL in Australia. And we have closed that gap. You know, the puckheads get very sensitive when I denigrate hockey, so I'm not gonna do that right now. But look at where mixed martial arts is in the United States of America right now, relative to where it was prior to the Fox deal. Like, I think we're getting there. I just think we need to exercise some patience, right? I mean, UFC one was in 1993, so a lot of these sports have a, you know, century-long head start on MMA. I feel pretty confident that come 2040, um, not only is this thing going to be mainstream domestically, but it's going to be top three if it isn't already. And to talk about the Frank Yeager moment last night, you talked about like how much you mean. You called him like the most beloved American fighter. Is there anybody else nearing the end of their career that you're going to have to be that emotional also when they say goodbye? Well, Jose Aldo obviously just walked away. You know, Dominic Cruz isn't going to be retiring anytime soon. But for me, you know, he's one of my best friends in the world, my broadcast partner. So I think that's going to be a little bit bittersweet for me, just given all the injuries and adversity that he has sort of dealt with. But, uh, yeah, this Frankie one is really special. You know, as much love as a Boston guy can have for anybody from New York or New Jersey, I'm excited for Frankie. Yeah, I'm a fellow New Englander, so I, I get the sentiment. I can't give him too much love. But uh, uh, last question. Obviously, you... You know, you're doing every single fight. So you have to dig into the prelim fights that, you know, only the hardcores really dig into. Have you ever got to a fight where, or a card where you dig so deep into these prelims that you might be more excited about the fight first, the second fight of the card than you actually, the main event? No doubt often. about it. And certainly I still put in the same amount of preparation for this title defense for Adesanya as I did when he fought Rob Wilkinson in his UFC debut. But yes, certainly when there are new fighters that come in, prelim fighters, you uncover a lot more stuff that is new to you and potentially new to the fan base. So absolutely that stuff gets me excited. And, um, you know, I do believe when I lose my love for the preparation, I'll probably walk away and give a younger guy a chance, you know? I love the preparation, you know, it's a labor of love for me. And, uh, you know, obviously my chief charge with the UFC is to humanize these athletes and to bring those stories to the air in a sport that moves very quickly. Um, but yeah, Hay is not quite in the barn for this one, but we're, uh, we're excited to get to fight night, brother. You've been... Uh, John, just... Hi. You mentioned uh, briefly about the UFC, uh, about Australia, and of course the UFC is going to be returning back to Perth. What is your opinion about Alex Volkanovski moving up to, to lightweight and obviously Islam, facing Islam and his comparisons to Khabib? Yeah, I mean, Islam Akashev looks to me like a guy who could reign for a long time, but I'm excited to see what Volkanovski can do with it. You know, I don't lean too much into the size discrepancy, at least right now. I want to see Volkanovski bulk up to 155 pounds and then maybe make my assessment. Uh, but yeah, I think the fight makes sense. I mean, you know, Perth backdrop for Volk, I think that should help to whatever degree. But I just, anytime you have a champion that is willing to fight the best guys in the world, I mean, Israel Adesanya is a guy who deserves a lot of credit for being a promotional workhorse. He's essentially headlined 20% of our pay-per-views since he became the man, which is a pretty impressive statistic. And I think Makhachev is going to be cut from a similar cloth. Like, just give me the contract, give me the guy you guys want me to fight, and I'll go fight him. So excited to see what Volkanovski can do with it with the caveat that Islam Akashev looks like a guy who uh, should be favored over any lightweight in the world and any featherweight in the world as well. And, and just, just uh, lastly, what do you think about the comparisons with you know, him and Khabib? Islam and Khabib? 
Well, certainly I would lean into what I've heard from Javier Mendez and Daniel Cormier. I mean, they do believe that in terms of the striking, that Islam Akashev is a little bit more layered a striker. I think in terms of the nuances in the grappling, they're pretty similar, but I feel like Islam just maybe has a slightly better frame for lightweight. He has stayed a little bit healthier, you know, throughout his run to the title. So, um, but yeah, I think he's a little bit of a cleaner striker and maybe has a little bit more ways to win in that realm. But um, yeah, they got some similarities to be sure. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all for coming.